has anyone ever asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Do you ever want to say, I want to be happy? I want to be serene? Or have you already figured out your plan? Do you know what you're going to do for education and a job and family? <laughs> well, in high school, I thought I knew what I was going to do. I went to college ready to learn everything I needed to learn to accomplish my modest goal. I am not kidding when I tell you I just wanted to create world peace. <laughs> I was pretty original. <laughs> so I'm a sociologist now, but after that first year, rough year of college, I had dropped out and didn't know what I wanted to do. As a sociologist, I get to answer pretty interesting questions. For example, how can we find science kinds of people? How can we engage all youth with science? To answer these questions, I'm part of a team that studies identities. Identities are really important. Identities shape our beliefs and our behaviors. When people ask, what do you want to be? I think they really want to know, who are you? But most people just don't ask that question directly, unless they're a sociologist <laughs> and they're studying identities. Then we think it's perfectly reasonable to ask people to tell us answers to the question, who am I, at least 20 times. When I think about this question, I think about being a mom and a wife, a friend. I think about being white and female. I think about being a professor that I can hear and that I can see. Maybe some of you are more visual. Maybe you'd prefer to draw a picture of yourself. It can be difficult, though, to pick just one image to draw. What would you be doing or wearing in your picture? We let other people know about our identities in a variety of ways. By what we wear, maybe our t-shirts, maybe our hair or tattoos. Other people can also make decisions about who we are, even if we don't claim the identity, maybe based on our height or our skin color, the way we talk, our name, or where we live. Other people can also act as mirrors, how they see us shapes how we see ourselves. OK, now based on my interest in science, I'd like you to imagine for a moment, if you were going to draw scientists, what would you draw? What would your scientists be doing? What would your scientists be wearing? I have to warn you that one of my favorite phrases is, there's a study about that. <laughs> and there is a study about drawing scientists, believe it or not. There's over 50 years of research on this topic. We would expect that there would be change over 50 years, but still the stereotype of a white man in a lab coat, glasses, crazy hair, it persists. This pattern raises a challenging question. How can we engage all youth with science if some youth don't fit the stereotype? I have spent years trying to answer this question. One challenge has been my own assumptions. I used to think that scientists were just born geniuses. They didn't have to work hard. They could just do science. Or I thought scientists were just the natural scientists, the chemists, the physicists, geoscientists. Even, OK, sorry. <laughs> All right, so is it a problem? Is it a problem to have these images of scientists? It is for me. I want everyone to have the pleasure that I feel learning new discoveries, maybe even creating new discoveries themselves. Science is a valuable resource. People who have science knowledge, science abilities, scientific thinking, they have power. They have privileges. I want everyone to have access to science. People who know science, they can even tell the difference between more and less valid science. And we learned today that's really important. OK, so one of the questions that I was part of a team trying to answer was, how can we find science kinds of people? When I tell people that that's what I want to talk about or I study, oftentimes they just kind of look at me funny and say, OK, that's what you want to study. We had good intentions with this question. We wanted to make sure that when we did after school clubs or we disseminated emerging science, we reached everyone who might benefit from it. To do that, 
we did a survey in a middle school in a large Midwestern city. We surveyed over 400 youth. To measure science identities, we first asked, do other people see you as a science kind of person? They could pick not at all, a little bit, somewhat, or totally. We average the scores, and we should show up here, eh, thank you, that on average, <clears throat> the scores were low, about two or a little bit. We next asked, do you think of yourself as a science kind of person? And the scores were a little bit higher, a little bit above a two. We could have stopped there. We could have just figured that, on average, middle school kids have low science identities. But we were worried. What if some youth have the potential to engage in science, but they don't claim the identity because they don't think they fit? But how could we measure a discovery orientation, a propensity, without using the word science? We discussed this on my team, and we finally came up with an idea. We could ask about characteristics that scientists have or engage in. So are you curious about the world? Do you like exploring nature? Do you enjoy new discoveries? Now, the average from those responses was much higher, or about a three, closer to somewhat. Even more important, for those three questions, there was only one respondent out of over 400 who said not at all to all three questions. So do these scores differ by gender and race ethnicity? Yes, for the science identity items, but no for discovery orientation. For discovery orientation, very similar responses. But for the identity items, the boys who are white had significantly higher scores than the youth in the other categories. I find these patterns disturbing. I want all youth be able to be able to claim a science identity. Can we do anything about this? Yes, and many people are working to make science more inclusive. I had the good fortune to be part of another study where we randomly assigned comic books or essays to over 800 high school students, again, in a large Midwestern city. <laughs> so. Let's go to the next slide. And these are the comic books. OK. So after they could read the essays or the comics, the youth took a survey. We asked them, would you want to read more material like this? I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that the youth that got the comics wanted more, more than the youth that got the essays. What is really powerful, though, is that when we break it down by science identity, the youth that got the comics with the low science identity, they wanted to read more as much as the youth that got the essays in the high science identity group. Let that sink in for a minute. That is really powerful. That means it's something about the way we communicate science, not necessarily something about the kids. I saw how the comics connected with youth in another setting. We did an after school club with fifth graders in a high poverty school. In the first week, we gave all of the kids the comic books. A Couple months later, we were doing an activity. We were trying to understand the immune system. So we had some kids who were an attacking virus. We had some kids who were the skin, a barrier to that virus. And we had some kids that were the immune cells. They were gonna play this out. As soon as I said immune cells, one boy jumped up, ran over to his backpack, pulled out the comic books from two months earlier, ran over to me and showed me the page with the immune cells. At that moment, I realized his attachment to the comic book showed me how important access to science can be. Okay, analogy alert. I really want this point to come home. Okay, so hang in there with me for a minute. Let's imagine a mountain with a fantastic view and everyone wants to get to the top. There's two paths. One path is well-maintained, lots of encouraging people along the way, helping people reach the top of the mountain. The other path is rough, not well-maintained, few, few people encouraging the travelers and maybe some even discouraging them. The people on each path 
They don't know there's another path. Who's going to make it to the top? And how would each explain their success or their failure? Okay, it can be tempting to think that there are some groups in the United States that just aren't into science. But our evidence suggests it's not the kids. It, the problem is the packaging, the stories being relevant, showing images of scientists from around the globe, throughout history, a great diversity of scientists who are doing amazing things. Am I a science kind of person? When I started this work, I didn't think so. But through the research process, I changed my mind. I realized I really loved the comic books. I love learning about microbes and genetics and viruses. I loved learning along with the youth in our after school programs. I also realized I'm a social scientist that studies getting people into science. And maybe that makes me a meta scientist. <laughs> OK, so in my life, there were many cues that I had a high discovery orientation, even though I don't remember anyone encouraging me to claim a science identity, not even after I won a science fair in seventh grade and again in eighth grade. As I mentioned, I dropped out of college. The important thing about that is that I had time to explore many possible future selves. Thankfully, one of my cousins, Patty, she saw in me the social scientist I could become. She urged me to take a sociology class. I did, and I was transformed. All of a sudden, the world made sense like it had never had before. I took another one, I took another one, I stayed for a decade, and I earned three degrees. <laughs> and now I teach sociology. <laughs> okay, a little bit of passion there. All right. So I'm, I'm just so grateful I had people who could see in me the social scientist I could become. I want everyone to have that. Finally, the answers to my burning questions. How can we find science kinds of people? We don't have to search. We are all science kinds of people. How can we engage all youth with science? That's where we need to invest. We need creative connections to help youth find the kind of science that will matter to them what will engage them, what will be interesting, that's what we need to really work on. I can't wait to find out the creative connections that all of you will find to help all of us engage in science. Thank you. Thank you.